So John, I thought we'd start uh, kind of giving context about how you and I met. Mm -hmm. um, I was a student at the University of Toronto, and I actually never took one of your, your classes, but I was a student uh, in your meditation uh, sessions that you had on, on lunch break, which was great. And about maybe a year ago, you came on my podcast, the Intellectual Explorers podcast. Yeah. And then when we had uh, follow-up breakfast, I was mentioning to you these different conversational modalities that I've been experiencing and, and, and engaging in, like uh, verbal Aikido, circling, mm -hmm. um, uh, what is it like? insight dialogue, stuff like that. And then you got captured by mm -hmm. that sort of conversation. And then we decided to go on a research project together. Mm -hmm. um, kind of not only just reading the primary material, but actually engaging in the practices themselves. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of curious that what is your sort of thoughts on this journey so far that you and I have been going on? So there was two things. There was a, a criticism that uh, Jonathan Pajot had made uh, of my work, a, a very good criticism, you know, that it was very, for all of my criticism of autodidactism, I wasn't talking very much about, you know, collective uh, uh, psychotechnologies. Right. And so uh, shortly after Jonathan made, and you know, Jonathan's criticisms are always made um, in good faith. Um, uh, but um, uh, shortly after he made that criticism, you and I spoke, and that's why I was sort of like, ah. And then as I, got into doing the, the work with you and started reading some of the literature and, and starting to do some of the practices with you. Um, this was starting to gel with st uh, uh, ideas that were emerging in a conversation I was having. Uh, initially, the, uh, and, and importantly, because it was very provocative, was a conversation I was having with Jordan Hall. And he, I was trying to get him understand his notion of, of coherence. And then he proposed the idea of a meta-psychotechnology. I was thinking, the, the meta-psychotechnology in the ancient world with dialectic, mm -hmm. which, um, which uh, you know, and, 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 and it has all these dimensions, and I knew it, it had all these dimensions to it. And then I, I thought, oh, so first of all, Jordan's idea hit me like, you know, like the, wow, yeah, that's right. right. And, the, you know, there, and there's a relationship between the meta-psychotechnology for collective intelligence and the meta-heuristic for individual wisdom cultivation. Mm -hmm. and, and that was all, the relationship between those was, was integral to um, dialectic. And so, that sort of, you know, really grabbed me. And I thought, ah, what I want to do after awakening from the meaning crisis is I want to start developing a series that explores that. Because mm. I thought, well, what we could do is let's, like, like, let's really understand that very deeply and then bring it into dialogue with all of these emerging modalities right. and see if we could, you know, create what Jordan says we need, mm. which is the meta-psychotechnology that would coordinate with the meta-heuristic mm. of wisdom. And then, of course, you know, uh, the people at Rebel Wisdom start taking up this this idea, you know, uh, uh, about co uh, collective intelligence and how important it is. And so I just feel like I don't have any uh, any beliefs about destiny or, or a T loss or anything. Mm -hmm. But it's like everything was everything is just sort of really, um, you know, folding together in this sort of mutually. Um, uh, affording fashion, and at the same time, I, 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 I'm starting to, uh, you know, participate in more and more of these kinds of conversations with Jordan and with with Guy. Mm -hmm. Personally, for me, it's it's expanding mm -hmm. in terms of uh, like what's it mean for me and, and in my own personal ecology of practices. I'm trying to see how does it work with. Uh, things like Lectio Divina, how does it work with the contemplative practices, how does it work with the moving practices, because, you know, a lot of these modalities bring in embodiment, bring in mindfulness, mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 you know, so uh, bring in a new way of trying to re even relate to language. Um, so it's just been, it's just been, I feel really, really privileged, uh, and again, the, the timing for me is I'm on, I'm on sabbatical, so I could just like, I could just go crazy on this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just been wonderful, just wonderful. And like one thing, I just want to like send you gratitude and love your way, because uh, you know, Dave and I were talking about the, the intellectual dark web and how some of that, that dialogue there just seems fossilized. People mm -hmm. are kind of like attached to their viewpoints, but seeing you like, dialogue with Jordan Hall or, or Guy or in the in-person Intellectual Explorers Club, I see your insights in the moment and just those like aha moments that you have. And I almost see you rewriting your map live. Oh, yeah. And so I'm curious, like, uh, why do you think that is for you? Oh, uh, that's a really good question. I'm, part of it is, um, well, uh, th these are different aspects of the figure of Socrates and, and the practice that he had. Um, so, it's very, a Socratic dialogue often doesn't end in an argumentative conclusion. Instead, 
what's often happened is, you know, aporia, a kind of profound insight that challenges people to change, um, to enter into an aspirational project of transformation. So, um, I've, uh, from the very beginning, I was interested in the connection between inference and insight. And so I developed my teaching style and my way of doing scientific theorizing in which I really tried to integrate uh, both insight and inference together. And then as I developed mindfulness skills, brought those to bear. Um, and, and so I very much, I, I, I like, I very much try to get into something, and I think it often is, into a flow state when I'm uh, teaching, and and the, and and then that is often best afforded if there's a more dialogic relationship with my students, and then that got taken up into, and it's being developed uh, in in these dialogues I'm having with people, mm-hmm. and, and so. That's really important to me, and, and thank you for, for, for what you just said, because there's sort of a, a model that's emerging in my mind, um, and it, it goes to a, an argument that I've already been presenting in the series about the, the difference between intelligence and rationality, and that the way you get rationality is by having intelligence to, to sort of, rec- you know, recursively apply to itself and improve its own mm-hmm. application, and one of the hallmarks of Rationality is to care about the process as much if and, uh, and at times more than mm-hmm. the product, mm-hmm. right? It's the opposite of bottom line thinking, mm-hmm. right? And so what I'm starting to see is that, and it's very good that we're starting to create psychotech and uh, practices for, you know, coalescing and accentuating uh, collective intelligence, but we need to bring in the psychotech that gets that collective intelligence into what I would call collective rationality. Again, I don't mean you know, it, rationality doesn't mean logicality, etc. I mean, it's it's a much more comprehensive notion. Right. Uh, so and, and so moments of insight are often very much about that. When I see right where there's there's been like sort of this going on dialogue, and then there's an insight, and I, uh, it, I it's like a problem reformulation. Mm-hmm. Right, because you're 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 not see the, the key to insight isn't the, what happens in insight is you're reformulating the problem. You're paying much more attention to how the problem is formulated before you're going for the answer, and so insight is when the dialogue is going through something like a restructuring or reformulation, and then there's this awareness of the process, and that's an opportunity to to intervene for the sake of cultivating the collective intelligence into collective rationality. Mm. Although, you know, I mean, I'm working hard to try and open the notion of rationality up to be much more comprehensive. Uh, but I sometimes are now, I, I, I now use the word like collective wisdom uh, because it, I'm, uh, that's, that, that's the sense of rationality I, I'm trying to uh, point towards. So insight for me is both personally uh, optimizing. I'm, I'm moving into something like the flow state, but it's also like, and, and it's tapping into uh, the sage I've internalized, Socrates, but it's also pointing forward to like how how are we going to how how are we going to relate to and inhabit the space of collective intelligence and reshape it so that we can start to we can start to enact collective wisdom and do what you see in the platonic dialogues turn that wisdom on central and important topics and issues that concern right. uh, human beings right and something that uh, you said that struck me is that uh, you said the bottom line thinking And, uh, you know, it seems like uh, what's neutered is the opportunity for us to gain insight in an intersubjective uh, dynamic. And I wanted to talk to you about, like, I-it relating with Martin Bruton's term. Yeah, yeah. Um, Like, for myself, I work at uh, Dale Carnegie uh, training. I'm an instructor there, so I teach interpersonal skills. And uh, when I was younger, I had massive anxiety, social anxiety. So I kind of, like did everything, acting classes, Mm. improv classes, Toastmaster. I understand. And I discovered a lot of these kind of, like, intersubjective modalities that were more I it like sales negotiation even yep. like pickup artistry and it seems like in the professional environment which is sort of like what they say game a a lot of people are having these I it relationships with each other mm-hmm. and it's like I'm instrumentalizing you uh, to get something so I'm treating you as an instrument and I like this term by uh, C. Wright Mills I think the marketing mentality mm-hmm. it's not only am I making you an instrument I'm making myself an instrument so I can be easily used by you mm-hmm. and there's a sense like 
people wearing a mask. There's this existential loneliness, a hunger for something more. Uh, and there's this prevalence of bullshit yeah. uh, as an art form now. So I was wondering if you can speak on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and Fram actually also talked about the uh, the, the market personality. Right. Um, so, yeah, a, a, a convergence of ideas here. Yeah, I mean, so if you look at, you know, the IET or what Fram would call the, the, the having mode, the categorical representation, manipulation, control, mm. it's oriented around problem solving, right? Uh, and this is something I think we should, uh, I'm going to make a point that I think we should start refining our discourse about this practice. Um, so I'm going to make a proposal to you. I often hear people talking about the kind of practices we're doing as being sort of motivated by curiosity. And I propose that we shouldn't be using that. Mm -hmm. I propose that we should be thinking about wonder a lot more. And this is important because Socrates famously said that wisdom begins in wonder. Because wonder, puts, wonder is a state where you're, what you're doing is you're opening up a space so that you're confronting mystery. You're, conf you're, you're calling into question yourself and your world mm -hmm. so that they both can undergo the restructuring mm -hmm. that you and I were talking about a, a moment ago. And wonder can be deepened into awe, which is a powerful, you know, has a powerful uh, ability to, to pull people beyond their egocentrism. Mm -hmm. That's one of the, you know, one of the, one of the features of awe is reliably is it takes people out of e egocentrism they feel humbled right they, they, they get a sense of you know i don't mean this pejoratively but being put in their place and and and, and their, that that their worldview their world and their self is too small uh, for the reality that they've confronted and i see what was happening in plato is you know you're trying to you're trying to deepen wonder into awe and and get that going and that's what i feel is happening when i'm doing these modalities right whereas it's not curiosity. I know what curiosity is like. You know, I'm, here's a pro, you know, here's a here's a gap in the knowledge, and I run an experiment, and I try and close it, and mm -hmm. you know, that, and that's important. It's, you know, it's how you get, how, how you deal with ignorance. But we're not trying to solve problems here. We're trying to, uh, I think, in, invoke um, our participation in wonder, so that we actually platform people going through a transformative process, mm -hmm. and so. I think we should, in, in order to break out of the I, it, and get into I, thou, we need to pay much more careful attention to the terms and the states that we're trying to inhabit. Mm -hmm. I think trying, becoming more familiar with participatory knowing of wonder is a way of moving into an I, thou relationship where I'm trying to confront that space in which restructuring of identity, both my identity and the identities in the world is possible so that I can fulfill the developmental needs that are central to the being mode. And so I think that's an important thing. We need to start, we need to start, I mean, that's part of why you, you and I are doing what we're doing. We need to get more careful language and more careful thought uh, because we're, I think we, sh we should start thinking about moving beyond the inception stage and, and the promotion stage of these modalities to, as I said, can we start to integrate them with good cognitive science and move them in, in, in a particular direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's this term that came up, just like there's this wonder phobia in society at large, it seems like. Um, and you and I were talking about like experimenting with these modalities and even like maybe experimenting, creating new ones. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And there's a sense that there might be, uh, needs to be bridges that we have to build, like uh, the anti-debates that we're experimenting here at the sure. International Explorers Club. Sure, sure. Uh, do you have any intuitions about how to go about that? Um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, one, one of the intuitions is uh, to get people to realize that it is possible uh, to enter into, see the words are so loaded, but to enter into argumentation without entering into, if, you, if you'll allow me this, without entering into dispute. Uh, uh, so what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is like uh, getting people to understand the difference between opponent processing and an adversarial processing, mm -hmm. right? And so Plato had a term for this. You know, there's philia sophia, which is we come together and we, we, we each recognize we have bias. And, and then I realized that one of the things your bias is actually really good for is pulling me out of mine and vice versa. And so we can fit together. We can do that opponent processing and create a logos that has us doing something we can't do for ourselves. 
because our biases are trapping us and making us stuck. But if we coordinate them in the right way, we can actually call each other beyond our biases, right? And, and so that's a point of processing. And that, that's, that's a real possibility for people in, con in contrast to the mentality of adversarial processing, you know, what, what, what Plato called phile and Ikea, the love of victory. Mm -hmm. where what, so it's an adversarial winner-take-all, crush the opponent. Because that attitude actually, right, removes the possibility that, that is, you, I think, I, and I think that possibility is very much dependent on a, a kind of opponent processing, the possibility of self-correction. Again, if people, if people can start to move to that idea that they can be, right, they can be an opponent processing without being adversaries. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think that's a very important thing. That's a very important bridge. Now, what that looks like in terms of a specific practice, I'm not, I, I don't know yet. I, like, I see it happening in individual uh, conversations and dialogue. When, and, and it often happens around when people will bring this topic up for me. They'll bring it up, right. and, and then you can see that they, they, they get it, and they, they, they shift because they want to try, they at least want to try it. And I, I, I found it very powerful uh, a lot of those times. So I think that's an important thing that we've got to, we have to start uh, bringing, bringing into it. How, and if we could get people to realize again, I mean, this sounds so trite, right? But if we could get people to realize again how much we need each other mm. uh, in this, um, as opposed to needing to be right, um, that, that could be bene a beneficial bridge. Right. It's like uh, there is a sense that, uh, of debate fatigue, I'm noticing. And there's this term I quite like uh, by Scott Aikens and Robert Talese uh, called the dialectic fallacy, mm. where there's like this gesturing that we're here to have a, you know, a good faith conversation, but really we're just trying to score points with our tribe. Yeah. Right? We're just trying to win type of thing. And, and there, there's incentives for why that is, of course. Uh, but there's, I think there's an area to be playful here and then this idea of the anti-debate where you yeah. sort of have this kind of like confrontational aspect about it but you're gamifying understanding to give people a taste of sort of like an I thou way of relating. Well yeah and I think the I thou relating right and bringing in r rationality as I would describe it is about can we get people if we get them to understand opponent processing can we get them back to valuing the process for its own sake. So I've adopted some practices I do. I try to, you know, okay, how do I know if I'm really listening? I know if I'm really listening if the, another person triggers an insight in me. Mm -hmm. So so it's a marker for me. If I, if I can go, oh, wow, ooh, restructuring, and that didn't or originate with me. That, so I look for that, and I try to sensitize myself for it. And I, I, try, to, I try to sort of, as much as I can, set things up so people uh, will feel free to sort of be more playful uh, and, 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 and possibly afford an insight. Mm -hmm. So I, I, do, I, I do something like that. Also, I try to see, and of course not insincerely, but where I can step back and exemplify self-correction and say, oh, that was a mistake or that was imprecise. And where I'm not trying to, again, do some sneaky sly thing so I can then trap you into the conclusion I want you to come to, but because it's like, oh, right, what I ultimately want for this is to engage in this kind of self-correction, this self-organizing self-correction. Now, you have to be sensitive to where you're interacting. Like when I, there's certain arenas where that confrontation has to be more uh, combative. I mean, like, so when you're in the scientific arena, like, you have to come to conclusions because for, for reasons of funding and publication and blah 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 and that you know and so you have to accept that but if we can if we're, if we're not so much pursuing knowledge if you allow me this distinction but cultivating wisdom i think we can like we can shift over to trying to and i'm not saying that what i just proposed to you is exhausted this is stuff i'm just working out right now right. but can we give people a list of things that they can pay attention to, that are markers, that they're oriented to the process and they're in opponent processing rather than adversarial combat. So can you explain what opponent processing means? Yeah, so uh, let me give you uh, an example uh, from um, uh, your, your own nervous system and the way it connects you to the world and helps you uh, cope and care about the world. Uh, so this is your autonomic. Notice it's self-governing. That's what autonomous means. Your autonomic nervous system. This is this part of your system that is responsible for 
regulating your level of arousal, not your sexual arousal, mm -hmm. your level of arousal. How much metabolic energy are you expending right now? And, and, the, and the point is there's no algorithm for that because sometimes you need to be really, uh, sometimes, and, and you, you can't be Canadian, like just sort of middling all the time or anything like that. So well, what, what is, and it, this is just an example. You can see this in multiple scales throughout biology, with like within your own, uh, within your own uh, uh, physiology. But let's do it with the autonomic nervous system. So what you have is it's divided into two subsystems. There's the sympathetic system. And what it does is it tries, it's biased. It's biased. It's trying to interpret as much of the environment as it can, as, as many stimuli as it can, as indicating that arousal should be raised. Mm -hmm. The parasympathetic system is the opposite. It's trying to interpret as much of the environment as it can. It has a, an opposite bias as, no, arousal should be diminished. And then, so they're working sort of opposite to each other. They have opposite biases, but they're conjoined together causally. So as the sympathetic system tries to ramp up, it tries to shut down Right? It tries to downregulate the parasympathetic and vice versa. So what they, you got is this constantly dynamic, moment by moment, fine-grained, self-organized recalibration of right, the best interpretation of the environment and the most appropriate level of arousal that you should have coupled. And it's coupled together. Mm -hmm. And so that's a point of processing. It would be, it would be insane if like, like if the sympathetic nervous system, no, my view is right. <laughs> and what I have to do is kill the parasympathetic, you would then die. And, and the capacity for self-correction and dynamically and fluidly cal recalibrating on the fly, your level of arousal uh, would, would be lost. It'd be, it, I mean, I was in a conversation this morning and one, one of the people said, oh yeah, that would be like cancer. Like where one set of cells is now, I'm gonna win at all costs and has stepped outside of you know opponent processing into adversarial so if we could if we if we could if we could mimic that right interpersonally right. what's happening intrapersonally that's what i that's what i mean by opponent processing so you and i are sort of doing circling together mm -hmm. on a regular basis we're not just researching we're practicing it participant observation hopefully getting a, a, an ethnography out of it right. And, and uh, like our last circling, I've had like insights and it was powerful and was interesting because there's both insights within. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's constitutive insights that are in, so I, I've argued elsewhere with Leo Ferraro and uh, Adrian Heron Bennett that flow is a, a sort of an insight cascade. And I think, and I've mentioned to Guy this, that I think what's happening in circling is you're, you're trying to get a flow state going in distributed cognition. And what, so you get, you get constitutive insights. These are insights that sort of prompt the circling and keep it going. And then there's these meta insights where you step back, right? Like we do when we're checking out or reflecting at the end. And you sort of, you get insights about the process itself. You understand the difference here between the constitutive insights that generate the flow and then the meta insights where you sort of take away and go, oh, I have an insight about what's going on there. And, and, and in our last circling, I had, a pow I had both of those in, 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 in to a very powerful degree. So just for people who have no idea what circling is, and I know uh, David is interview guy, and you can watch videos on it. Oh, it's, it's really hard to describe, like in an elevator pitch. But what would you say to circling is for someone who is not really aware of it? Well, people often use uh, mindfulness, but I think they they use a meditative uh, uh, analogy, which I think isn't as good. Mm. So let me try an, an analogy here, because often if you give people an analogy, and then you you can specify it into more technical terms. So I'm a Tai Chi Chan player, serious play, right? And you're always trying to get this bi-directional awareness going. They talk about like having two eyes. So one is an awareness that's going deep into your body and into your mind, not into your thoughts, but sort of tasting your mind. What it's, what's its temperature and texture and tempo? So you've got, you've got this inner eye, and then you've got an outer eye looking out at the environment. And then you know the way your left and right visual fields do stereoscopic fusion, so you get depth perception? Mm -hmm. What you learn to do in Tai Chi is, initially you're doing both of these and you're moving back and forth, but eventually you get that stereoscopic fusion. The inner and the outer, right, fuse together. And so you get, you, that's part of how you cultivate Chi, right? And what you get then is uh, this, this way in which you get very coupled simultaneously to your embodiment and then to the environment. And then of course you move. And what you're trying to do with the movements is you're trying to create um, flow because the, the, the point of the movements is they 
yin and yang, they expand and contract, and your attention is expanding and contracting, and right? And so all of this is, it, it, this is very powerful technology uh, to try and get you in, into a flow state. And now I think the same thing's happening in circling, but instead of the movements being movements of body, there are largely movements of discourse. Mm. So what's happening is, you know, you, if you, to get into circling, uh, you're, you're, you're bringing this inner awareness, a kind of mindfulness, but it is, you're trying to get it fused in this dynamic sense with an outer awareness of what, what's going on in other people. And then you're trying to make movements that get that into a collective flow state. Um, so what happens often in circling is people, they'll, they're, they're doing a thing where you can see that they're trying to, they'll, they'll give a little bit more attention to right, what's going on inside and then a little bit more out. And then they also do the zoom out. What's the whole group? What's the individual? And so I, I find it very analogous uh, to uh, the practice of Tai Chi because you got the, the, the zooming out, the zooming in, and then you've got the attempt to fuse the outer awareness and the inner awareness so they're mutually affording each other. And then this is all being coordinated so you're getting something like a collective flow state that accesses and I think accentuates um, um, the, the power of distributed cognition. It, it engenders... Um, collective intelligence right there. And to ground it for people who, who might not have experienced it before, uh, sometimes it's called the intersubjective meditative practice, yeah. and you get in a circle, an actual circle, yep. and then you have these sort of conversational uh, uh, kind of experiences. And they have these neat little warm-up exercises yeah. that we do yeah. beforehand, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, one of them I quite like is called the imagination game. Mm -hmm. And so we're just kind of sitting across from each other, and then I'm imagining something about your reality right now, yeah. whether what you're feeling or what you're thinking. And then I state it, and then you confirm if that's true or false. Yes. And then you do it to me. And then if you do this back and forth, your intuition muscles gets quite strong. Yeah. You build up what Siegel called <clears throat> mindsight. And I, I built a little bit on that, on the idea of mindsight resonance. Mm -hmm. So mindsight is your ability to pick up um, on other people's mental states. And so what human beings do um, is, and we're doing it now. So I, I start to pick up on your mental state. And then you start to give me cues, often embodied cues, like the nod or... As I pick up on you, you right, give me cues to help me pick up more on you. And then what I then do is I tailor my, myself to allow you uh, mm -hmm. to pick up more on me. And so what starts to happen is I read you, and then that helps me uh, better present myself so you can read me better. And then you're reading me, and then you present, and then we resonate. Yeah. And so a lot of what, what's happening with uh, a lot of the warm-up exercises for circling is we're trying to create... Uh, mindset resonance right and um... because if I know your mental state it's right I, I'm much more successful at restructuring my communication so you'll get me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then vice versa we loop right and there's like like you're saying there's so much insights that are flowing in these yeah. sessions that we're having and then you're dropping some amazing bombs uh, one of them that happened the last session uh, you had to play on words of peer yes right? so yes. if, if uh, you're someone's peer you have the the capacity to peer through them yeah. but you're also allowing them to peer through you yes and so uh, yeah that 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 play the, so that's the playfulness that you're so that was one of the like yeah that like it was like a constitutive uh, like that really that really helped me stay in the flow. Uh, I also, uh, that very same time, I had, I had, I had that, what I would call a meta, uh, you know, a meta insight, because I was coming to the realization, uh, well, I had the experience that when, when, you're in, when you're in circling, people, like, you get that salience glow that you're in the flow state or when people are in psychedelic experience, right? And so I asked other people, "Is like, it, was that the case? And, and you were there. And other people were saying, yeah, yeah. And then there was a report that that's, this is often reported. And I, and, I, and, I, and I thought, okay, well, I know what psilocybin is doing on the brain. It's getting areas of the brain to talk to each other that don't normally talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And I was one, and, I, and there's a big, there's all the hyperscanning synchrony studies. When people are doing this interpersonal stuff, the brain starts, uh, they start synchronizing in important ways. So... I would, you know, I, I, I'm not claiming this is the case, but this is a, a really interesting hypothesis to explore. That what's happening is circling gets the interpersonal patterns of connection to be novel and restructured, and we're and we're communicating in ways we don't normally do, and then then that gets internalized as areas of the brain 
talking and communicating to each other in ways they don't normally do. And then that feeds back out to help the restructuring of the interpersonal. And then that feeds back in to help the restructuring of the inter... And then you get that loop going. And if you've already got a mind site resonance going, you could see why that would loop so powerfully. Right. And um, like what comes to mind is this, this circling in particular. It's like a, a gym to practice truthfulness. Uh, and Daniel Schmachenberger had this interesting distinction between you know truth versus truthfulness, where truth is like the correspondence theory of truth. Your map of reality accurately maps over to reality, so it's like you arrived in a way. Where mm-hmm. truthfulness is that process, the mm-hmm. ongoing process of mapping. And one's a property, and the other's an, uh, the other's an ideal. Right. And and then this mapping process, it sort of it localizes it in circling to, to the immediate moment, to your your felt senses, your thoughts, mm-hmm. and whatnot. So I think that's very good. I mean, but one of the things I would like. Uh, I suppose, I, uh, for our project, I don't, I, I don't want to mess with circling. It is what it is, and it has the values it does, and I want to continue practicing it. But uh, it would be nice if we could, if we could bring, like, so in Tai Chi, if, if all I'm ever doing is sort of reflecting on my, right, mm-hmm. then I can't actually ever, I, I couldn't ever spar, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> I couldn't actually ever use it in self-defense. There has to be, there, it, what I'm trying to say is, yes, we, we get all this coordination going and we come into the present moment, but you have to be able to come into the present moment so you can do something there other than find another present moment. That, you, you, like, that's what the, so if, if you'll allow me to play a little bit more with, the, with, the, with the, the Tai Chi metaphor, and this is what I see happening in Socratic dialogue, you have all this stuff going. You know, Socrates will say, did you, did you, do you believe that right now or did you just hear somebody say that? If you just heard somebody say it, don't say it. Tell me what you're feeling or believing right now. Like, be participatory. So Socrates is doing that. But he's not doing it just to keep people in the present moment. He's keeping them in the present moment, getting this loop that we're talking about going, so then they can then turn. Like, it's like I feel sometimes, Mike, it's a worry. Like, you know, we've got, we're, 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 we're building this powerful machine, and then we're just like, look at how beautifully it runs. Look at how, rush, you know, how, let's oil it some more. Let's, ooh, so it's running better and better. And you, and you have to do that. You have to care. But, but like, what do we want to do with this? What I want to do with this, uh, right, and, and is it would be nice, like I say, if we could use it, if we could, if we could, if we could bootstrap collective intelligence up into collective rationality, and then we could turn that powerful, self-correcting, insightful machine, if you allow me this analogy, onto issues like what is wisdom? What is a good life? What is meaning? Like, like the things that we need to have good discussions about right now, because all of these things have fallen into impoverishment, and that's one of the things driving the meaning crisis. But we could, like, we could reduce Re- revitalize them in really powerful ways. And so you and I have sort of a, a like to-do list of all these modalities to check <laughs> exactly. out, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so we're engaging in circling right now. We mm-hmm. have something of insight dialogue. We mm-hmm. have empathy circles, mm-hmm. restorative circles by Dominic Barter. And my read is that all these are deliciously incomplete. Yes. You know, yes. And we're getting yeah. a taste of them, but they're hyper-focused on one thing. One's on empathy, one's on connecting. Yeah. And you mentioned this in uh, the last time you came to the Intellectual Explorers Club, is that like a call to arms for like philosophers and scientists, but yes. also artists and entrepreneurs mm-hmm. to kind of play with this and see if we can discover something new. Yeah, totally. I mean, and again, um, um, not to hammer on this point, but that's exactly also what you see in the Socratic right, dialogues. Socrates, oh, well, he'll talk to philosophers, he'll talk to Parmenides, or, but he'll talk, he also talks to generals, like he talks to everybody. Well, I think these issues, in one sense, are philosophically profound. I think they are philosophically profound, not in the sense of academic uh, conceptual clarification or argumentation. I think they're philosophically profound in the, in the ancient sense, in which they concern trying to get an understanding, right, an understanding and a self-knowledge that can really help people aspire, as I said, to, to wisdom and to enhancing meaning in life. And I think, um, you know, if we're going, if it's going to be effective, it has to help, it, 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 like what Socrates does, it has to be able to reach everybody who wants to be less self-deceptive, more connected. And I, 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 this is a platonic conceit on my part. I think that deep down, everybody does want that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think very much, um, 
we've got to we've got to engineer this and reverse engineer uh, this so it can do exactly that. That we can we can say, look, we need we need we need uh, this term is so. Uh, so our terms, like, well, this is what we need. Right? So many of our terms have been emptied and rendered thin. Right. But, 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 but we, we need a kind of, you know, cognitive diversity so that we can enrich the ecology of practices as much mm -hmm. a, as possible so that the evolution of, right, the abilities that we're seeking are, are, are optimally afforded. That's, that, that's, that's what we need. We, need. we need a lot of people involved. Right. And it's like, it's not just you and I doing this. I just want to like send out an invitation, like use this conversation as an opportunity. Yes. It's like yeah. everyone who feels resonant about this kind of uh, adventure that you and I are on want to join. Like, come on, let's experiment. Let's, yeah, let's... Yes, I think so. I think so. As long as, as long as people bring with it this attitude of serious play, right? right? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm sensitive to the criticism. Uh, I think Alexander, Alexander Bard made it in, in one of the videos that he did with... Uh, Andrew Sweeney, uh, I, I don't want to try and recreate the, the salons of the ancient regime mm -hmm. where people sat around and talked about the important issues and problems of the day mm -hmm. while doing nothing as the French Revolution is brewing, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not making any accusations. I'm, I, I'm saying uh, that's what I don't want uh, what we're doing to, to become. Um, uh, it's got that's it's I, I, it, like the meaning crisis and the meta crisis. I think are urgent. They're exigent. They're existentially threatening, both philosophically existentially and literally existentially threatening. We don't want people who are coming for to be in a salon. Mm -hmm. we, we want people instead who are more like like I said, or like what happened around like like you know Socrates that practice. Mm -hmm generates stoicism as a way of life, as you know, that eventually reaches to the height of the Roman, the, the emperor become like a stoic philosopher. Yeah. And it's like, so I run the Stoicism Toronto group here yes. and, and I try to practice stoicism as best as I can. And uh, my co-founder, Daniel, uh, he views like, we were having a discussion on what is the stoa me mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. a stoicist place not where just stoics talk and you know like and you know just geek out about stoicism it's a place where anyone can come to philosophize about what's most important yes exactly right? doesn't matter if you're a roman emperor or you're a roman slave yes, like in yes. marcus Aurelius or epictetus yes yeah. exactly exactly and, and you know and then and and the, and the dialectic also gets taken up into in, into the church mm. uh, because you when you see like how does thomas aquinas write he writes like a, 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 in dialectic form where there's you know question and answers and back and forth and th and that gets taken up into so so these things have the potential to be fundamentally uh like capable of fundamentally restructuring the, the cultural cognitive grammar of major institutions like the emperor or like the, you know, the pope, right? Like, so that's what I'm hoping, I mean, wow, that's really hubristic, right? But that, that's what I want as, the, uh, uh, as opposed to the alternative of the aristocrats um, sitting in the salons discussing things endlessly. Right. And you mentioned the, the meta crisis, and, yes. and how I hold that is that we're faced as a species with all these existential risks that are in, uh, interconnected with each yes. other. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether it's the economy or the environment or AGI, and coupled with that is our inability to sense make the is and odd of what's going on. Yes. Right. And and in sort of. All these sort of mimetic tribes that uh, I've been tracking through the, the culture. Wonderful war. term, by the way. Great. Thank you for giving us that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, whether it's Extinction Rebellion or Effective Altruism or some of the reactionary tribes when they talk about the Black Pill, it's like they're all looking at the same reality, the same meta crisis, but they're hyper focused on one area. Mm -hmm. They're not talking to each other. Right. So this is like what you get in children, according to Piaget. You have what's called, um, like, there's a kind of fixation. So. What development often means is, right, opening up the number of variables that you find relevant and salient, and that's not just a, 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 that's not primarily a belief thing. That's a perspectival participatory thing. It's a developmental thing, right? Opening up the number of variables and, 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 and how they're related in order to stop falling prey to a certain kind of bias. And so I hope, I'm hoping that what we can do is get people to, to and to that, 
right? Where, no, no, we're, we're, there's like the way I was describing it to you. Notice there's all these, I, I'm trying to, in the phenomenology, I'm trying to pick out what are all the dimensions going on in dialectic, right? And, and how can we, how can we teach people to coordinate them so that they're like the kid that goes from centration to the adult they can pay attention to multiple variables like as the child is to the adult the adult is to the sage that's one of the you know the ways of understanding wisdom and that's that's what I, that's what i'm really interested in right and when we were talking last time i mentioned it seems like to me you're operating in two intellectual ecologies right now one in the academic sense you're doing formal research yep. and then this sort of this wild west of <laughs> intellectual i like that too by the yeah, way yeah. yeah and in in the wild west is sort of what you and i are doing this research in the strange attractor there seems to be this authentic dialogue, mm -hmm. you know, and this is like the antidote to the meta crisis. Yes, well, I think I think there, there's I mean I think there's deep reasons for that. Uh, I mean, I, so what the what the academic research is showing is like what what are the kinds of things that actually contribute to a people's uh, a sense of meaning, and I, I, so I think what people are looking for w w when they're doing this. I, I, I find the term authenticity problematic, uh, but what people are looking for when they're looking for, I'm going to use it in the title of the series, but what people are looking for is, the, is they're looking for, I would argue, they're looking for a form of discourse that brings in all of these levels, like all of these kinds of knowings so that underneath the communication there's communing because people need to feel a deep connect, a deep connection. Right, and it also is flow affording if we're connecting that way, other than just connecting with the content of our beliefs. And people, and what one of the things that's predictive of how meaningful your life is is how often you have flow in it, because you again, it's the sense of being really connected, really coupled to how the world is unfolding. And I think why that's important, because I think, well, I argue that the mental fog that is preventing us from really getting a grip on formulating the metacrisis, doing good problem formulation on the metacrisis, as Thomas Bjorkman calls it, right, is uh, the meaning crisis. We're in, we're in scarcity mentali mentality about meaning that reduces your cognitive flexibility, removes the capacity to flow, removes insight. It, and so it just, it just, it's like you get, lo you're, lo you're like the kid, you centrate and you hold on, you get into the eye yet, you're trying to hold, and, that, and then you lose all of the cognitive flexibility that is necessary for reformulating and restructuring how we're going to address the meta crisis. So I think people are coming at, I think this is kind of a, a, a really good intuition that if we can't figure out how to get the self-correcting opponent processing going on again, so that we can, we can massively, you know, restructure, right, you know, collective intelligence, we're not going to be able to, to formulate the problem in a way we need to solve. We have all the data. About like in the sense of the data, it's like you know you know the Necker cube where you, you, it's like a, a diagram and you look at it and, and it's like a block and it, it it flips right. All the information is there. What changes isn't the information. What changes is what's salient. What what aspects come forward? What aspects recede? And where we need we need an aspect shift on the meta crisis. That's what and I think people have a sense that it's got to be an aspect shift coming from collective intelligence, the kind of restructuring that you and I have been talking about. Right. And just to use the, the simple metaphor of the, you know, the blind man and the elephant. Yeah, it's like yes. we all have our hands on the elephant, but we're not talking to each other. We're yelling at each other. So how do we get into dialogue with each other? But if I, if I, would have, if I were to understand that I'm in one spot and I have therefore have a bias, this is again, kids. Kids are egocentric. And what you have to do as an adult is learn that you know, you are seeing this room differently than I am right now and take that into consideration as I move around or as I'm talking to you. <clears throat> you have to do something analogous there. It's like, well, uh, you know, I know that I'm biased and I know you're biased, but one of the things your bias can do is call me out of my bias. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we were talking earlier about how both of us feel kind of pulled towards this, whatever this is. Um, and I just want to say that I'm incredibly grateful for being pulled alongside it with you, my friend. Oh, thank you very much, my friend. I, me, me too. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I think this goes back to something primordial. I, I, I want to challenge the bullshit in sort of individualism, which is different, by the way, from individual responsibility, which is, which is, uh, you know, a, a moral requirement. But the, but the idea that we're all self-made is ridiculous, because what, what actually made us so. Ad able to kill it. I mean, look at us individually. We're, we're fragile and 
kind of badly designed as animals. We don't have good claws. We're not particularly fast. We're standing in this way in which we're always perpetually falling, exposing our throat and, uh, and our vital organs to predation. Well, what do we have? Well, what we have is we can coordinate together, sharpen some sticks and get some dogs, and then we can kill anything on the planet. What made us so powerful was this ability to tap into collective intelligence and coordinate distributed cognition to solve problems that we can't individually solve. That's our great ability. Our adaptive advantage across, across speciation was our ability to coordinate together and create you know, distributed cognition, enact collective intelligence, and put that to, to, to achieving goals that are far out of the reach of us as individuals. There's, there's been recent research Right, where, where they've taken they've taken rat brains. This sounds Orwellian, but this is happening, and they've actually linked them together electronically. And the brat, the rats are capable of solving problems that the individual rats can't solve. Mm. And there's been some recent experiments using chips linking humans. This is how this, you know distributed cognition and the power of collective intelligence is a real thing. And I think because it was you know our advantage across species across speciation in evolution, we are wired to, find, to seek it out and to find it inherently valuable and deeply motivating and deeply rewarding. And, and, and so like, I think like, like religions uh, were, were masterful at this, like you know, the, the, the body of Christ or ecclesia, which means the gathering. They were, they were masterful at gathering people together, you know, enacting, creating these psychotechnologies, rituals that enact and engage distributed cognition, bring collective intelligence up. And I would go so further. I think that what a lot of the, the religions were able to do was to take that collective intelligence and bring it into what I'm calling collective rationality. And that, so it's powerful for us. And it is what we need, I would argue, if we're going to bring about the restructuring, the fundamental aspect shift we need, if we're going to address the meaning crisis in such a way, that's why I use the word awakening, not solving. It's an aspect shift out of the meaning crisis, out of the way in which it's fogging our mind so that we can get to the mental flexibility, the mental wherewithal, so that we can restructure and reformulate the meta crisis. Mm -hmm. And then we've been talking about the sense of urgency with this project yes. as well, because if we don't figure this out, we're, we're going to kill ourselves. I think there's, I think there's, uh, I was talking to David the other day about this. I think there's sort of two senses of urgency. There's that, there's the existential urgency, and then there's what I would call chirotic urgency. There's a kairos here, and we've got, we, and kairos is, they, 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 there's a reason why spirit is the wind. It comes and goes as it will. Who has seen the wind? Neither you nor I, right? But, you know, but what is it? When the trees are bowing down, the, the wind is passing by, or whatever that famous poem is. But the idea, it comes and goes as it will. Jesus says that in, in the Gospels, too. The kairos is here. I think that's, but we can't count on it staying. It will, it, it's spiritus. It will come and go as it will. And if we don't get the spiritual sensitivity to pick up on it, we'll lose it. So there's also that urgency. And the two urgencies are not independent of each other. They accelerate and exacerbate each other. If you liked that video, I'll be using some of these conversational techniques we just talked about this Thursday in an exclusive event for Rebel Wisdom members called Psychodynamic is Political, the Art of Mimetic Mediation. I'll be repurposing some of these techniques into a very fun and interactive session around the theme of mimetic mediation which is all about getting people from divergent political and philosophical backgrounds in conversation with each other. Check out the show notes below for details. It's this Thursday, August 27th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time.